Okay, um, I think it is time to, uh, what you got for class to start. Uh, let's start with some announcements, just to make sure everybody understands. Um, first, I, I guess I'm, I'm sorry, I could not be here um, last class because of the uh, religious holiday. Uh, I think we're now good for the rest of the semester. But any, any question, how did people think how Yi Min did? Who do you think she did a good job? Who do you think she did a bad job? Who do you think I should just have her take over and I walk away? Okay, uh, some people. Okay, good. Um, any questions about anything that she was talking about? She was talking about randomization. She was talking about, um, what you call it, about um, uh, uh, merge sort. Any questions or issues that came up from that? Okay. I'm happy to take any discussion, or though it seems uh, under, everything's fine. Okay. Um, what else are people going to want to ask about? I suspect some people want to know about the midterm. The midterm is next class, am I correct? Am I too loud now, or uh, is, this, is this right? Feels a little different than usual. Everything says fine? Okay, good. Um, okay, so what is the story of the midterm? Like the sample midterm on the web page. It will look, the exam is going to consist of three-ish um, homework style problems. These homework style problems are, I'm going to give you a secret, every one of the homework style problems appears as an exercise in the book. So what is a great way to, to um, what you call it, to make sure you do well on the homework style problems? Go through all the homework problems in the book for um, what you call it, all of the uh, exercises at the end of the four chapters. If you could do every one of them, you're obviously in good shape. Now, I do not expect people to do every one of them, but I do expect that uh, if you're looking for things to study, a good thing to do is to go through these problems and think about them. An especially good thing to do is to make sure you do the uh, homework questions on sorting from homework two. You guys have turned in homework one. I believe they've been given back now. Um, the uh, homework two, part of that assignment is on sorting, and I recommend that everybody do those problems before the exam, because that's when it will do you the most good. Okay? Any questions about that? So there will be three-ish assigned problems from the back of each chapter, a total from, from the back of the four chapters, a total of three of them. And there will be 30-ish multiple choice questions. And um, as far as rules for the exam, we will not answer any questions about the multiple choice questions. Each one doesn't count for that much. If you don't understand the question, what should you do? You should guess, OK? You should make an assumption of what I'm probably trying to say and try to say that. But we're not going to make any, answer any questions about the multiple choice questions. Any questions about it? Um, if there is a misunderstanding about one of the problems for the written problems, the three bit problems, the TAs uh, or, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll bring that to my attention and we can, th that maybe can be discussed, okay? If you really don't understand one of the words in the assignment or something, but uh, I'm taking some pains to make sure that that's clear. Any questions? So how do you study? I think read it, the, the, doing the uh, study, doing the chapter, you know, what you call it, doing the uh, homework problems is good. I think reading the chapters in the book can be good because obviously that's the material I'm basing this stuff on, okay? Um, I'm not going to try to trick you by giving you a lot of material that's not stuff we talked about in class, but in here it's important to kind of understand the stuff, and sometimes doing a reading gives you a better understanding. Any questions about the exam? For the multiple choice part, you're gonna, we're going to presumably be using Scantrons, and so I want everybody to come in with a pencil 
would be a good idea. Okay? So you get a mix of a, a Scantron and a, a, a written document. Any questions? I will seat you guys where you, where you guys are supposed to sit. Okay, when you come in, you'll line up outside and we will assign you to where I want you to be. Okay, any questions about that? Yes? So, uh, just chapters one, two, three, and four, right? Chapters one, two, three, and four, yes. Okay, any question about that? Okay. Now, I want to make sure everybody understands. I try to make my quest midterms, hopefully, reasonably hard. I am happiest when the, when the average in the midterm is in the 60s, okay? If you get a score that is in the 60s and the median, the median is in the 60s, are you failing the course? I didn't hear that. Are you failing the course if you got it in the 60s? A little louder? Okay. What are you getting if, in fact, your average, your score is right around the median? What is your expected grade going to be based on just that data point? I didn't hear that yet. B minus, right? So I don't want anybody kind of jumping, you know, jumping off a bridge. Oh my God, I didn't do very well on this. Okay, this is not a course where people are supposed to get, some students will get 100 on the exam or close to it. But I do not, there's, there's a broad spectrum. The people I am concerned with are the ones that fall, you know, 20 or 30 points below the mean. Okay, those are the ones that who, whose, you know, fate I am worried about, okay? Getting a C in this class is not the end of the world for anybody, okay? And, you know, that's, again, if you get, if you get on the meeting, you're at about a B minus, okay? You're at a B minus. Any questions about that? Okay? Um, anything else people want to know about the exam? Yes? How many points is it? Uh, again, you will see, whatever is on the paper is what it will tell you. But typically, there'll be three problems. There'll each be 20 points for the real problem and maybe 40 points for the multiple choice or something like that. Okay, so it's about, you know, grossly in the same range, not necessarily exactly equal. Any questions? Okay, any other questions about the exam? Now, how else can you study? My understanding is the TAs the re who run the recitation have set up an extra review session that you can learn about. That's potentially interesting. Okay, anything else? Okay, any other questions about the midterm? Okay, if not, I wish you good luck on it, um, and we will deal with that then. Okay, um, okay, any questions about anything in particular? Okay, I am, uh, I'd like to start with the, qu the, the problem of the day, um, which is a very interesting problem for kind of understanding the power and limitations of randomized algorithms. This, I believe, is the problem, the nuts and bolts problem, right? So what is the problem? You're given a collection of nuts and bolts. Does everybody remember? what a nut and a bolt is. You know, a nut is this thing that you've probably seen. It's a hexa typically a hexagonal thing with a hole in it that's got a screw thread in there. A bolt is a uh, piece of hardware where there's screw threads on here and uh, it's got a lid and that you, you connect nuts to bolts by screwing them in. Does everybody remember that, understand that? Any question what a nut or a bolt is? Okay, what is the problem? You're given n bolts, each of which has a different width. The bolt, remember the width of the bolt was the width of this part. Okay, you're given n nuts. The width of them is all different. The width is the size of the hole. Okay, if you have a nut and a bolt that are exactly the same, the right size, they can be screwed together. If you have a nut where the hole is too small, it can't go on. Does everybody see that? And if you have a nut where the hole is too big, it doesn't stick. Okay? 
Your job is to take the end nuts and the end bolts and pair them up. Okay? So you have the right size nut for every bolt. Now, you can't, the difference in the holes is so small that you can't compare a nut against a nut. You can't compare a bolt against a nut, a bolt against a bolt. You can only compare a nut against a bolt. Does everybody kind of get that idea? Any questions? Okay. So what can I ask about this? Um, let me try this. No. Okay. My first question is, let me erase this. Can you give me an n squared algorithm to, 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 in terms of the number of comparisons to connect the nuts to the bolts? Can anyone get, yes. I take every nut and I compare it to the pile of bolts. Do you fit too big, too small, too big, too big, just right, right? <clears throat> I'm going to do this for each of the n nuts. It might take n comparisons against bolts till I find its partner, right? Does everybody see that that, that would give me an n squared algorithm for, uh, for pairing them up? Right? Now, what if I want a different question? Okay? Just to sort of warm up again. Suppose I want to find uh, only, I want to pair up the smallest nut with the smallest bolt. So I'm given a, a bunch of, a pile of nuts, a pile of bolts. I want to find the smallest nut and, the, and bolt pair that match. Can I do that in 2n comparisons? How would I do that? Yeah? So first you would have to compare one nut and a bolt. I compare a nut to a bolt? Yeah, smaller. Okay, so if I go like this and it doesn't fit, what, which is smaller? The nut is smaller, right? If it goes like this, the bolt is smaller, right? You're saying throw away the bigger one. What do I do if I have them perfectly fit together? Keep either one, but put the matching one in my back pocket because I might need it later. This might be the smallest pair overall, right? But what does it, does everybody see what he's doing? In one comparison, assuming he didn't end up with equality, it should be clear that with one comparison, okay, he's automatically, he's thrown out, on the typical comparison, he throws out one, either a nut or a bolt. There are a total of two N nuts and bolts to start with. At the end, we have two. If every comparison we throw each one out, okay, then we get the two N minus two. And we have to be a little more careful about what we do when we have equality, but I claim the same basic principle holds, okay, that we will end up with that many comparisons. Any questions? Yes. Can I find the minimum one? To confine the minimum one among the nuts without using the bolts, I would have to compare a nut to a nut, and I'm, I can't do that. Okay? So all my comparisons have to be through bolts. Nuts have to be compared through bolts, and bolts have to be compared through nuts. Okay? Any questions? Okay, now, then there is the interesting problem. Can you match? We saw that we had an n squared algorithm for this. Can anyone give me an expected n log n time for algorithm for pairing up the nuts and the bolts? Okay. Anybody? Yes. Okay, so what we're saying, you want to say use quick sort. What are you going to do? You're going to pick an arbitrary, let's say, nut. This is my pivot nut. What am I now going to do? 
I'm going to compare every bolt against my pivot nut, right? And so here I've got my bolts that are smaller, my teeny tiny bolts. Here I've got my big bolts, okay? And that took n comparisons. What's, and I've also got one that's the just right bolt, correct? Because one of them's done. Now what do I do? So everybody see, I took my nut, I compared it to everybody, I broke them bolts into bigger, smaller, and the same. Now what, I, what do I do? Yeah? I petition the nuts based on what? The bolt. I take this bolt and I compare it to the nuts. And now I've got a set of small nuts and a set of really big nuts. Okay? These nuts may work for a political party or something like that. Okay? Um, what would be the, uh, what you call it? And now what is the next thing that I'm going to do? You're telling me now I've got a collection of nuts and bolts that are less than my pivot pair, the ones that are greater than the pivot pair. Does everybody see that all the matching, all of the bolts that match these nuts are here, all the bolts that match these nuts are here? I have broken it into two recursive problems, and this is exactly going to be the same story as quicksort. I took two, started out with n, okay, in general I'm going to hopefully divide it roughly in half, not exactly in half. After a linear amount of work, this is the exact same story as quicksort. Does everybody agree that this is an expected n log n algorithm? Any questions about that? Yes? I don't want to hold that question, because there's something I want you to admire about this, first of all. You guys have been, many of you guys are, are people who've been whining to me. Oh, I've got all these n log n sorting algorithms. Which one is best? They're all the same, okay? What's interesting about this problem, everyone agrees that the naive algorithm was n squared in the worst case. Here's one where the expected algorithm is n log n. What's interesting is there is no easy, known easy algorithm to solve this problem in, in worst case n log n time. Okay? The quicksort idea solved this one in n log n easily. This problem, interestingly enough, I do not know a quadratic, uh, a, a subquadratic time algorithm other than using the randomization. Randomization is a powerful idea in algorithms. You can sometimes do things that you don't really know how to do any other way. It's not just that there's this alternate way of doing it. Interestingly, with this problem, there is no, um, basically no way to do this in n log n except by, by faking the randomization in a very esoteric way. I, I'll, I'll table that, okay? So I want people to admire that for a moment. Any questions? Okay, now tell me what your question is. Oh, so is 2n minus 2 the worst case scenario? Yeah, is 2n minus 2 the worst case? Well, I'm going to say 2n minus 2 is the worst case and also the expected case and, and the best case in this thing. Why? When you compare two nuts or two bolts, a nut or a bolt, you can only eliminate one of them. You need to end up with two of them at the end. So pretty much, again, there's a special case of when equality comes that we got to be a little bit careful about. But it should be clear that when you get the equal case, it's not an immediate win. Okay? You can event, you know, you can't throw anything away yet. But once you can throw away one, you can throw away the other. Okay, but generally speaking, you can only throw away one nut or bolt with each comparison. So this is kind of the right, the right bound on just about all runs of this. 
Any questions? Okay, any other questions about nuts and bolts? Okay, any questions about randomization and why randomization is such a powerful idea? I'm happy to continue to talk about that a little bit. What, may, what randomization for quicksort did that was interesting was it got rid of the worst case. What is the worst case distribution of nuts and bolts here? We agree that if you got unlucky, what's going to happen? You pick a nut and you find its corresponding bolt and you discover it was the biggest. In which case you divided the set of n nuts into a set of n minus 1, a matching pair and an empty set. That's bad, right? You wanted half big nuts, half small nuts, okay? Notice that there's not a bad input case to this, though. It's not like someone can give you, oh, I'm going to cheat you, I'm going to put my nuts and bolts, I'm going to put my nuts, nuts in such a way that you're going to pick a bad one. If you're really closing your eyes and picking a nut, okay, at random, there is no bad case for this. Okay, a bad case would be there's an unlucky case. This is the difference in thought here. The bad case for insertion sort was if you gave them the numbers in the wrong order, in the reverse order. Then you were screwed and it was going to take you n squared time. Notice that if you're picking your pivot at random, there is no way the bad guy can give you something that's going to mess you up if you're picking your, your pivot at random, okay? It changes a bad input case, a question of are they giving me something bad, to am I very, very, very unlucky, okay? And the probability of being so unlucky that you're going to get screwed and run in quicksort is so phenomenally low, we don't worry about it, okay? Any questions about that? That's the big idea of randomization, okay? And it is one of the powerful ideas in CS. Yes? So Okay, so the question is, if you are, you know, you're taken hostage by someone who says, I demand you sort my data quickly. What should I do? Okay, well, one possibility is to say, um, you know, first of all, from what you know in this class, you know the running time of, of these sort of algorithms are n log n. Okay, now the difference between whether one algorithm is twice as fast or, or not is not a big old question. It's a practical question. If you say, should I use a sorting algorithm that's twice as fast as, 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 if this algorithm is twice as fast, should I use it? The answer is probably yes. But it's, notice this is not a kind of a question that can be answered by the big O, right? It can only be answered kind of by experiments and, so word on the street, from what I've been told, okay, is that quicksort is two or three times faster than these other sorting algorithms. Okay, in practice, assuming everything's in main memory, assuming you don't use your ca have a funny cache memory and uh, where there's, there's jumps and blocks moving around. So and do I care about this in a world where I'm living in the big O, which is what I am doing when I'm teaching here and you are doing when you're taking the exam? They're all the same. In the world of, am I going to spend twice as much money on computers to sort my data? Maybe it matters, okay? And then that's, that, that's, a, that's, that's a, it's a different kind of question than I can do with the big O, okay? And a relatively less interesting question than the question of n squared versus n log n, where there's a, an enormous, enormous difference, okay? Any questions? Any other questions about uh, quicksort, randomization? Nothing. Okay, let's go on to some 
Uh, other questions here. Hold on. Um, boom. And I'd like to now ask a question, which is, a, which is uh, an interesting theoretical question and potentially practical question. Is it possible to sort, f sort faster than n log n? Okay. With n items, okay, you might think maybe there's a way to sort in linear time. Okay. Maybe there's a quicker sort that Skeena isn't telling me about or uh, that hasn't been discovered yet. Okay. What's interesting is there is a way to prove that any comparison-based sorting program has to take at least n log n time to sort n things. Now, what is a comparison-based sorting program? What is the basic operation in quicksort? You're taking an element and comparing it to the pivot and saying, is it bigger or smaller, right? What is the basic operation in merge sort? You're taking the head of two lists and saying, is the left one before the right one or the right one before the left one? In heap sort, what are you doing? Basically, I guess you're comparing an element against its parent or child and saying, is it bigger or smaller? Okay? All of these algorithms we've talked about, insertion sort, bubble sort, yada, yada, work by comparing things. And I'd like to now argue with to you that there is no way for a comparison-based algorithm to, um, what you call it, be faster than n log n in the worst case. Now, why is that? Well, I want you to assume the following things. Recognize that the input to sorting is an arrangement of items, an arrangement of numbers. OK? And what should be clear that is that when I execute an algorithm on a given algorithm on a given permutation of items, it's going to make a sequence of comparisons until it ends. OK? And the program, any program that correctly sorts, can't do exactly the same thing on two different permutations. Why? If the sorting, you know, what is the sorting program going to do on this? It's going to move this one here. It's going to move this one here, this one here, this one there, this one there. If I give you a different permutation, it's clear it's got to do something different. If the program did the same thing with two different inputs, there's a problem. Does everybody agree? OK. It's got to do something different. OK. So what does this mean? We can think of any, the execution, any sorting algorithm, we can think of as a tree of comparisons. OK, what is this tree of comparisons? Notice every node, you've got an original input array A, where you've got A1 here, A2 here, A3 here, right? This tree is a sorting algorithm, OK, on three elements. Can anybody tell what sorting algorithm this is? Yeah? Binary tree sort, the answer is no. Now we may say, well, wait, there's a binary tree. OK. Notice there is a tree, but it's not a bite, and it's a tree with two nodes coming out. It's not a binary search tree. Remember, the binary search tree, you had a key at every node so that it would say are things greater than or less than that. What this is, is this is an execution tree of all possible ways to execute insertion sort, OK, over all possible input permutations. What happens if we are sorting 1, 2, 3 by insertion sort? 
What do we do when we do one, two, three by insertion sort? We first compare one against two, right? And in this case, the first element is less than that. Does everybody agree? So we don't do anything. For the second thing, we compare the third element against the second. And we don't do anything, right? So in insertion sort, we compare the first element against the second. If that's true, we then compare the second, meaning A1 is less than A2. We compare A2 less than A3. If that's true, we're done. And that would only happen if the input numbers were 1, 2, 3. What would happen in insertion sort if the numbers were 3, 2, 1? What's the first thing that we're going to do? We're going to compare A1 against A2. And now A1 is not like less than A2. Does everybody kind of see that? So this test is going to come out to be false. Once that's done, we're going to sort of rearrange this to 3, 2. And we're now going to compare 1 against the third element. OK? A1, the first element, against the third element. Is that true? No. A1 is not less than A3. We're now going to go and do this compare. That's now going to mean that this is going to be here. We're going to now compare what was the third element against what was the second element. And we're going to do that. And again, this is false. It's going to do that swap. So insertion sort, if the three comparisons all come out false, that only happened if it was all the elements were in reverse order. Does everybody see that for all six possible arrangements of the, um, the, the, the keys, this shows the set of, 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 um, of comparisons that we make. The path of comparisons down the tree are what we did to sort that item, that particular permutation. Any questions about how this tree of comparisons is really insertion sort? That's what you got to see. You got to look at that tree and say that is insertion sort on three elements. Okay, if you don't see that, a question is I don't see it. Any questions? So if that is the tree of comparisons on n elements, what is the worst case running time of that algorithm? Any comparisons-based sorting algorithm can be modeled by a tree like that. What is the worst case running time of that algorithm? How would you describe it in terms of the tree? Yes? The height of the tree. Does everybody kind of see it? This node took one more comparison than this node to get. That's because 3, 2, 1 is the worst case for insertion sort and not 1, 2, 3. Right? So we agree that the height of the tree is the worst case running time of the algorithm. And any comparison-based sorting algorithm can be modeled by a tree where the leaves are all the possible permutations of n items. So how many permutations are there of n items? How many different ways are there to arrange n items in order? Somebody. How many? How many permutations or arrangements of n items are there? Somebody yell. N factorial. Does everybody agree? So here's a question. If we have a tree which is as minimum height, what is the minimum height tree where there are N factorial leaves? If I want to draw, make a tree which has N factorial leaves, and I want that tree to be as short as possible. 
What is the height of that tree going to be? Yeah? The log of n factorial, right? What was the deal with a heap? Remember, so, you know, it's going to be the, the height is going to be the log of n factorial. Right? Why is that? How ma what, as you take a tree, how many nodes do you get? The first height of tree of height one, you have zero, you had height one node. Height two, you had one, you had two nodes. Height two, you had four nodes. In general, if you had a, uh, n nodes at the lowest level, what was the height? It was log n. It's how many doublings do you have to take till you get to n, till n log n? And that's got to be the log of, I mean, if you want to, ugh. how many doublings does it take till you get to n factorial? That's got to be the log base 2 of n factorial. Any questions? So what is the log base 2 of n factorial? Let me see if I can make this clear. Okay, let me erase this so that the analysis is clear. We agree that we were interested in the uh, log of n factorial. What is the log of n factorial? Does anybody know what the log of n factorial is? Can anybody simplify that? Okay. One thing I could, would like to say is one way you could simplify it. I claim the log of n factorial. Let's look at ways we could simplify it. The log of n factorial. One thing I would like to say is that it is equal to the sum as i goes from 1 to n of log n. Do people see why that is? n factorial is what? 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 dot 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 to n. What is the log of a times b? What is the log of a times b? Does anyone remember? What is the log of a times b, yeah? Log a plus log b, right? That's exactly what I'm doing here. Does everybody see this? So the expression that I want to say is log of n factorial. It's actually a little bit it's slightly wrong here. Let me write this right. This is log i. Does everybody kind of agree with this? OK. What is this thing going to be? OK. Well, if you want to try to analyze it, what I claim is one way to think about it. Okay, does everybody see what's kind of doing? It looks like we are adding up n logs. Adding up n logs smells a little bit like n times log n, right? Except we've got to be a little bit careful because some of these logs are for small numbers and some of them are for big numbers. Does everybody agree? But what if I compare it to what I'm going to say the sum? It should be clear that this is less than i from 1 to n of log n. Suppose I change um, what you call it, um, log i to log n. Because the index goes from 1 to n, does everybody agree this side's going to be bigger than this? What is the sum as i goes from 1 to n of log n? What is that going to be? Yeah? That's exactly n log n. Ah, death. This is going to be, on this side, is exactly going to be equal to n log n. So clearly n log n is bigger than this. What I want to claim is 
If we take a look at what is something smaller than this that is still log n, what if I consider the sum as I goes from n over 2 to n of log i? Let me write that on the board just because I can tell I can't read it anymore. What if I consider the sum i goes from n over 2 to n of log i? Does everyone agree that this is less than or equal to the sum as i goes from uh, what you call it, n over, from 1 to n of log i. Does everybody agree that this is smaller? Because I'm using fewer terms, right? Does everybody agree that this is bigger than or equal to as i goes from n over 2 to n of log n over 2. Here my counter i starts from n over 2 and gets bigger. If I take the smaller of these, does everybody agree that if I just sum it up from log of n over 2 to i n of log of n over 2, this is smaller than the sum of the log i's, because all the i's are bigger than n over 2. Does everybody agree this is smaller? And what is this? This is now easy to solve. This is going to be n over 2 times log of n over 2. What is the log of n over 2 equal to? Does anyone remember? If we want to make, simplify this to log n, what is the log of n over 2? This is going to be, basically, n over 2, this is equal to n over 2 times log n minus the log of 2. This is a constant. This now tells me this is 1 half n log n. This tells me that log of n factorial is greater than or equal to n over 2 log n. Okay? And this shows that any tree on n factorial leaves has to have height n over theta of n over t n log n or greater. Any questions about that? If we believe the tree represents the worst, the height of the tree represents the worst case time of that sorting algorithm, and any, n law, any sorting algorithm on comparisons has such a tree, okay, and this is an argument that any sorting algorithm based on comparisons must take at least n log n time in the worst case. Any questions about that? So this is very interesting. Sorting is one of the few problems in life where we have a, we, we, we have a lower bound. That is very, very interesting. We have an argument that you can't possibly sort faster than n log n in the worst case. Okay? And this is actually useful in that there's a bunch of other problems that you can use this to show that there's no faster way to solve it than n log n. You guys remember Professor Mitchell's convex hull problem. Professor Mitchell's a smart guy, but he can't find convex hulls better than n log n because it basically is related to sorting, and no one can sort better than n log n. Any questions about that? Okay. Any question about the lower bound proof and why it's impossible to sort faster than n log n? Okay. And there's some other analyses there. 
My question now, any questions? Now, is there any weasel words I used when I said, damn it, you can't sort fast, you have a comparison-based sorting algorithm faster than n log n? Is there any weasel word that I used? The weasel word is comparison-based. Might there be some other way of sorting that does not involve comparing numbers together? Okay. Is there something that, for example, let's think about some technique in here where we did something kind of funny to think so we didn't have to compare them. When you built a hash table, were you comparing elements to each other when you were hashing them? Actually, you were comparing the hash codes. That's a little bit of a different thing. Okay, maybe there's some weasel words there. Okay, let me show you a uh, idea for a non-comparison sorting that may sound like it's going to do something interesting to you. What if I propose the following algorithm to sort n numbers from 1 to m? Okay? So I know I've got numbers. I know they're all less than a billion. I've got 100 of them. How might I sort them? Well, what if I set up a total of n buckets where each bucket is one nth, uh, one nth of, the, of the space of numbers. So if m is the biggest possible number, they go from 1 to m. And if I have n buckets, I could divide the range of numbers to uh, a group that it goes from 1 to m over n. Each one of these buckets is going to be responsible for a range of numbers of size m over n. The first m over n numbers is in the first bucket. The second m over n num numbers in the range are in the second bucket. There are n such buckets. So there is a total range is going to be n times n m over n, which is m. That's what we want. Does every, any question, do people see my bucketing scheme? I'm dividing the space of numbers into n equal size buckets, equal size ranges. If the numbers go from 1 to m, each bucket is going to be of size m over n, okay, of possible number space and values that can go in there. Any questions? Now, if I am given a number, x, does everybody see that I can figure out what bucket it goes into without actually comparing it to any other number? Right? Let's think about it. If I compute the ceiling of x over m over n, that will tell me how many m over n's are there in x. That is going to tell me the index of the bucket I belong to. Does everybody kind of get that idea? So in constant time, I can take my number and tell me which bucket it's going to go into. If I have n numbers, or if I have n numbers that I want to sort, I have n buckets. On average, each bucket is going to be of size, it's going to have one or two numbers in it, a constant number of numbers. How could I sort it? If I sort the very few numbers in the first bucket, okay, it's only a constant number of numbers. I can sort it in constant time. Those are going to be the first ones, kabunk, kabunk. Only a constant number, then this number. No numbers here. Sort these. Kabunk, kabunk. Kabunk, kabunk. Kabunk, kabunk. Does everybody see? I can map every number, okay, to its bucket in constant time. The buckets should have small numbers of numbers in them. So I can sort them with whatever algorithm, and it's going to take constant time. 
per element, okay? Is this a linear time sorting algorithm? Who says yes? Who says no? Okay. Any questions about how the bucket sort is working? Okay. Is this a linear time algorithm or not? Does anybody have an opinion? Yes. What? It isn't sorted as a result of this operation, but if there are only a, a constant number of items in each bucket, then sorting it, sorting each bucket, notice I can sort each bucket independently. So if I use, you know, I could use, you know, uh, bubble sort even. If I've only got five elements in each bucket, five squared is 25, that's a constant, right? Is this a linear time algorithm for sorting or not? Yeah? Is it expected? Expected would mean that there's a randomized thing, right? I'm not making any randomized things, okay? Notice this is not an expected question. This is one that depends what kind of numbers they give me. What would be a bad input case for this sorting algorithm? Yeah? A high x value, if they were all high x values, what would happen if the numbers you asked me to sort, all of them were values between m and m minus m over n? Does everybody see that what would happen then, if all your numbers were big, then they would all end up in the last bucket, right? So this is, uh, so, and so this is the catch that we're getting, okay? Bad things are going to happen, good things would happen, if you promised me that the keys were uniformly distributed between 1 and m, then good things are going to happen, right? If the numbers were uniformly distributed between m and n, you promised me that. They're drawn uniformly from that distribution. This is great. But what if some guy who doesn't like you is giving you the numbers to sort? If they know what you're, that you're using this bucketing scheme, they're going to give you n numbers, all of which happen to be in the same bucket, and after you've done the distribution, you have learned absolutely nothing to make no progress towards sorting. Does everybody kind of see it? So the trouble here is that bucket sort has a worst case. Note that, and the worst case is in fact going to be an n squared kind of thing, unless you're going to use an n log n sorting out. You know, you're going to have to sort these guys. If you use an n log n sorting algorithm, then bucket sort followed by n log n sorting algorithm is n log n in the worst case. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay, it's an analogous thing with, um, you know, it's, it's important to see the difference between the guarantees. In this case, there is a worst case input. The guy who knows what algorithm for you, you you're using can screw you by giving you a, um, ex a set of input points that will mess you up. Notice that with quicksort, if you're picking your key randomly, okay, they can't screw you because no matter what you, what, how, where they put the numbers are, you're going to pick one of those keys at random. It doesn't matter what they gave you, okay? Any questions here? Bucket sort is fast if we feel we know a lot about the distribution of that, that's underlying the data. Okay? And often we're wrong here. Any questions?
My favorite example of being wrong about distributions came from when you looked at uh, names in what was, you know, names in a phone book. Again, I come from an era where people had phone books and sorting the names in the phone books was the classic big sorting problem. If we understand the distribution of names in a phone book, are there gonna be a lot of skinas in the Manhattan phone book or not? Who here thinks there's a lot of skinas in the Manhattan phone book? Who here thinks there's very few? Okay, there's me and cousin Alan. Okay, I'll tell you that much. Okay, how many Smiths or Chens will there be in the uh, Manhattan phone book? Does everybody agree there's gonna be a zillion of them? How many people named Shiflet will there be in the Manhattan phone book? Has anybody ever met a person named Shiflet? Well, I went to school at the University of Virginia, which was in Charlottesville, Virginia. And um, this is a section of the Charlottesville, Virginia phone book when I was a student there. Now, Charlottesville was a town of 50,000 people maybe about as big as Stony Brook or a little bit bigger, but certainly not Manhattan. Look how many shiflets there are. Deborah shiflet, Delma shiflet, Delma shiflet, Dempley shiflet, De Denise, Dennis, Dennis H, Dennis Dewey E. There are a shift load of shiflets here. Does everybody kind of agree? Why is this? Okay, it wasn't that the names of people in this population were drawn at random. It turns out, the, the story goes, there was this mountain clan of shiflets that fought with another mountain clan. And then the government dug, you know, um, built a dam where they were. And they moved the shiflets here and they moved the people they fought with someplace else. Okay? But so here's a, an example where, knowing what the distributions of names in the United States, there still are surprises. This is why we worry about worst case algorithms. What would happen if we tried to use bin sorting, bucket sorting, to sort the shiflets, to sort all of Charlottesville? The bucket that contains the S's, all the shiflets will be piled into that. Does everybody agree? Now let's say, well, let's divide that up. There can't be that many S's. Let's divide that, the S's up. Everybody's going to pile into the SH bucket. Does everybody agree? There can't be too many SH more. Let's divide into the SH's bucket. Now the SHI bucket, all the shiftlets go in. Does everybody kind of see what the problem is? If the data was not uniform, the bucket sorting would not work. Okay, and there are skews in distribution, and this is why we worry about worst case stuff. Any questions about, um, what do we call it, about uh, lower bounds, bucket sort, any of these things? Okay, now what I would like to do is offer, open the floor to any questions about anything from the semester, okay? You guys have an, you know, uh, you have 20 minutes till class ends. I, I can sit here and tell jokes, or I can go through um, what you call it, uh, problems from the homework or things that people are confused by. Is there anything people want to discuss about big O notation or data structures or sorting? Okay, yes. Okay, so let's just think about it. What is the same when it comes to logs? Do I think log of n is equal, do I think that log of n is equal to the log of two, which was the way you phrased your question? Do I think that those are the same? No, they're not the same. This thing gets bigger with n, this thing doesn't, right? But you were asking something different. What you were really asking was, 
How does the log base 2 of n compare to the log base 10 of n? Is that what you were asking? And in this case, the answer is in a theta sense, these are the same thing. Why is that? Because we can convert, there were, there's, remember there was a relationship that we showed that showed you could change the base of something. I never remember what that equation is, but it's something like, um, where do I have this here? So I'm going to write this incorrectly, but the spirit is going to be right. The log base A of n is going to be equal to the log base B of n, and it's going to be, let's say, divided by the log base A of B. I'm not sure that the, if A of B or B of A. Okay, and I'm not sure if it's divided or multiplied. That's something you can look up. But what's the important thing here? N here is the variable that goes to infinity. The log base 7 of 5 or 6 of 2 is a constant. Does everybody agree with that? This thing is really just some constant C. And it says that you can change the base A to base B by multiplying or dividing by a constant. Okay? And that's why in a theta sense, this is theta of that. Okay? For any constants A and B. Any questions? Any questions about anything? Yes? Would I go over what? Heap sort, okay? So what was the idea of a heap sort? Okay? Heap sort was going to be a flavor of selection sort. What was selection sort? Selection sort, remember, three, one, four, two, five. How did we do selection sort? We went through it and found the min. And now we have a three here. We went through the rest and found the min. Went through the rest and found the min, which was going to be a three. Went through the rest, found the min. That was how it worked. Now, in selection sort in an array without a data structure, okay, what did this look like? This was going four i equals one to n. Find the min, okay, and then delete the min, and then print out the min. I guess if you want, you can print it before you delete it, okay? Print the min or stick it in the array, and then delete the min. Does everybody agree that this is the code for doing selection sort? Normally, how did you find the min? You walk through the array one by one, and if you did it in the dumb way, we do selection sort that you know and love from 114 or something like that. You had a loop going around n times, finding the min of the items, took order n, printing it out, took one, Deleting it was just a swap, really, right? So that took one. Now, suppose we do selection sort with a smarter data structure. What data structure do we have that is good at finding the min and deleting the min? Is there any data structure that does both of those fast? What is that data structure? A heap. If we did this with a heap, this would be log n in time, 
This would be log n in time. This would be 1. And now, if we use a heap which supports finding the min and deleting the min in, logar in logarithmic time, suddenly selection sort is n log n. And suddenly selection sort is heap sort. Right? Heap sort is nothing more than selection sort with a better data structure. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? Now then, the, 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 the next question is, how does a heap do these things? And that's a more intricate question you may or may not be asking. Okay? Are you asking it or not? Okay, fine, you're right. In a min, take that back. In a heap, the minimum element was the root, so yeah, you could find the min and print it out. That would also take constant time. What is governing the cost of it? It's the deleting the min is the expensive thing. To make sure our heap has the min so always on the top so we can grab it quickly. We have to readjust the heap, and that can take log n time. Any questions? Actually, here's a question I'm going to ask you guys. Is there any... Okay. We agree Joe Mitchell is a great algorithm designer, right? Suppose Joe Mitchell came into the room and said, I have invented a heap, the Mitchell heap that is going to be able to do find men and delete men, both of them in constant time. Do we believe Joe Mitchell, or do we call him a liar? Yeah? He's a liar, that's right, you can tell him I said so, okay, today in class, okay? Why is he a liar? Does everybody see that if Joe Mitchell could do find min and delete min, both in constant time, does everybody see that Mitchell heap sort would run in order n time? Can Mitchell heap sort run in n log n time? No, because we showed that it's a comparison based sort and there can't be one that runs faster than n log n, right? So that's one consequence of, of, of this kind of analysis. Any questions about that? Okay. Any questions about anything else that people want to talk about? I want to talk for another 12 minutes, so I do need something to talk about. Is it, yes? Okay, so is the fast construction of the heap linear? Is that going to mess this up? Is that going to give Joe Mitchell the chance to do this? Let's remember what's going to be happening. Okay? Um, the, the, what did we know about the complexity of a heap? We agree that you could build a heap. If you looked at the fine print in what was in the lecture notes and in the book, there is a way of building a heap, a fast build a heap, can be done in order n time. Okay? We agree that a insert, build a heap by insertion, That would obviously take something to be done in n log n. If we just kept starting from an empty heap and said insert an element, assert an element, assert an element. You're doing n insertions. If you got each insertion might take log n time. The fact that you could build a heap from scratch in n time is kind of cute, right? Now, does that affect our heap sort? Notice that there's part of heap sort that I didn't give. In here, there is the question of build a heap. In order 
to, um, what you call it, find the min and delete them, I've got to start by building my heap. Does everybody agree with that? If I do this the fast way, it would take order n. If I did it in the slow way, it would be n log n. Does it matter in a big O sense? The answer is no. Joe Mitchell can't do this part in n log n time, better than n log n time. n log n plus n log n is the same as n log n plus n. So in this particular problem, the fact that I can build a heap in linear time is cute and occasionally a useful thing to know. But that is not going to change what's going on with heap sort. Okay? Any questions? Any questions about anything else? Okay, I've still got you for 10 minutes, okay? And I don't want to end, okay? Any other subject or problem that is interesting to, you know, to discuss? Yes? Okay, so you want to know how do I find min and max in a hash table? Okay, open addressing, we didn't talk too much about the details, but let's talk about, first let's talk about chaining, because I like chaining as a simpler thing to talk about. How do I find the min, what are the operations if I'm doing a hash table with chaining? What is the cost of an operation? If I have a good hash function that scattered the n keys among the n linked lists in the table, what is insert going to be? Insert is going to be O of 1 because I'm going to hash my key, find out what bucket's in, and add it to the head of the linked list. Delete. In expectation, should be order one. Why? If I had a good hash table, if I have n lists and n items, generally speaking, the bucket that I am looking to delete from will have me and only a constant number of other elements. I can search this list of constant number of elements till I find me, and that will take constant time. Okay, there's a little bit of sloppiness with this analysis, but don't worry about that for now. Now, your question was, how do I find the maximum element in a, uh, what you call it, in a uh, hash table? If I have a hash table where I've got, let's just say, m buckets. This is supposed to be an m. Let me see if I've got a marker. If this has m buckets with a total of n elements scattered around it, okay, how do I find the maximum element, the biggest element in that hash table? What do I got to do? Somebody. Yes. I look through the first bucket. And I look through that list, nothing there, nothing there. And, oh my God, I've got to look for this. What's the biggest one I see? Is it bigger than these? Is it bigger than these? I've got to walk through M linked lists and a total of N elements scattered around the table. That's why I say the running time here is going to be order N plus M, right? If you give me a hash table with a ridiculous number of buckets, normally that's great for hash tables, right? Because insertion and deletion, I'm going to have fewer elements on average in each bucket. 
But to find the min, I'm going to have to, the max element. It's on one of these lists. I don't know which one it is. I've got to try them all. Right? Any questions? What about open For open addressing, nothing interesting changes. Okay? You've got a hash table now where you don't have pointers, but you have elements. And in some slots, you stuck elements. And maybe if you have to hash this guy here, maybe it's going to go to a different spot. You still have the problem to find the largest one. You've got to walk through all the elements. And take the biggest of these. This is going to take order the number of slots in your hash table. OK? So if m is the number of slots in the hash table, this would take order m. But the number of slots had better be bigger than the number of elements, or else you got trashed in the beginning. Right? Any questions? Actually, one question on this. Remember there was a trick that I think we used in certain data structures, like when we had the most important problem of the day, where we were able to turn finding the, max, the maximum element into constant time by keeping a pointer to it. Does everyone remember that? Could we make max in a hash table, could we make it constant time by keeping a pointer to the maximum element? Would that then mean that we can always do maximum in constant time? Who here wants to say yes? Who here wants to say no? Yeah? The answer is no. What happens if you now delete this element? Now the max has to change. You'll say, oh, well, I just have to now have it point to find out what the new max is. Where is the new max? Somewhere. I could do it where I could make maximum run in order one time. But that would make a deletion change to be expensive. Because now I've got to go through the whole hash table to find where that maximum is. Right? You should see with data structures there's a balancing act, depending upon how you implement it. Some things are fast, some things are, small, are slow. You can't make all the operations run fast. If you did, you'd be trying to make the same mistake that Joe Mitchell just did, okay, um, earlier in the class period. Any questions? Now, I've got three minutes to go. Any other questions about um, what you call it? Uh, uh, what you call it? Um, about anything? Any topic in here? Three minutes. Yes. I know you said you were going to provide an answer key for that multiple choice, but would you mind uh, providing an answer key for the first one? The answer is no, I'm not providing an answer key. Okay. Now, why is that? Well, I can change the answers later. And that, this gives me free. The b bigger reason is that I do believe that it's worth trying to figure it out. Sometimes these questions may be a little ambiguous and things like that. We'll try to grade them fairly. OK? But I do think that it's worth exercising. The wrong way to study for the multiple choice is to try to memorize answers to things that were out there. The right way is to understand the principles of what they do and how they fit together. OK, so I will look forward to seeing you guys here on Thursday. Um, bring your ID card. Bring a pencil. Don't bring your book. It's not going to do you any good. Don't bring a calculator. It's not going to do you any good. It's going to be taken away. Bring your ID cards, and good luck. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.